What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Welcome once again to Whispering Hope. We're so glad that you continue to support this ministry. And here we are once again on a Tuesday morning to discuss the lesson with you. Well, folks, we're going to get right into the lesson as fast as we can today. So we have more time to have a discussion based on what the topic is. We're still looking at the great controversy in this, the second quarter of 2024. And we're continuing with lesson number three for this quarter. With me, of course, is the usual tag team of Elder Andy David and Elder Jacqueline Gordon. Welcome, Elders. Nice to have you on the platform once again. Greet the folks first this morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. As usual, happy to be here. Happy to get into the Word of God. The Word of God is indeed truth, and we all need to be guided by truth. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to my team members. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide, lead, and direct our thoughts today as we get into his word. Amen. Nice having you. Elder David. Good morning and welcome to everyone this morning. Again, happy to be here also. I trust that the Holy Spirit will come by and be with us today as we continue to consider the great controversy. Excellent. With that, we're going to go into a word of prayer as Elder God is going to pray for us that our discussion and our insights, whatever we say today, is not of our own, but of the Holy Spirit guiding our thoughts. Elder God, pray for us, please. Let us pray, Almighty God and our Heavenly Father. And indeed, O oh God, we are thankful for this opportunity whereby, O oh God, we can just come together and allow your Holy Spirit to teach us through. Through your words. Oh Lord, let your words, oh God, ignite us. Let your word, oh God, inspire us to stand firm for truth in spite of what may come our way. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless those who are viewing, bless those who are listening, and let all of us indeed be drawn closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're looking at the lesson for this week, and it's entitled The Light Shines in the Darkness. Light shines in the darkness. So we'll get into that in a, in a bit. Phraseology there for me is a bit challenging, but light shines in the darkness. And our memory text for this week, Elder David is going to bring us our memory text, and then we're going to move on to Tuesday's lesson proper. Elder David, bring us our memory text, and just give us some insights as to light shines in the darkness and the memory text, how it all correlates. Our memory text is taken from John chapter 12 and verse 35, and it says... Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. So the Bible says here, Jesus speaking, says a little while longer and the light will be with you. Now Jesus is the light of the world. Now while Jesus was on earth, he came as the Messiah. He came, we all know, because of sin, because of, of the darkness of sin that engulfed the earth. And as a result of that, of sin, man was uh, doomed to die, to destruction. But Jesus came to offer salvation. So I guess when Jesus says, a little while longer, walk while you have the light, the message there to me is, look what? Accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the uh, one who came to pay the penalty for your sin. So that he can transform your life so that you can be saved. Now you said that uh, you are challenged with uh, the phraseology of the light shines in the darkness. Well, I guess when the light is switched on, it dispels the darkness. All right. So Jesus came in a world dark with sin to offer uh, salvation to us. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Elder David. Uh, I guess my challenge was that it's saying that light shines in the darkness. For me, once light is, once light exists, there can be no darkness. So I guess it's just me. You can shine a flashlight into the dark room and the light dispels, as you said, Elder David. But it's no biggie. It's no big issue. It's just my personal little quick with that. In other words, for me, it doesn't really shine into the darkness. It just dispels the darkness. But 
semantics. That's all it is. Elder Gordon, anything to add uh, in reference to the memory text for this week? I think Elder David would have given us uh, a good foundation there. Excellent. He would have done so. Except to add, you, the memory text states, walk while you have the light. As Elder David said, that Jesus is the light. He came amongst the men and he walked with them. However, God, Jesus here is admonishing us, walk while we have the light. It denotes to me, walk is used here figuratively, meaning that as a church, we are commissioned to do his work while we have the truth, while we have the light, while we are able to go. And so I think that it is quite eminent that all of us should be doing his work while we're able to do so. Why? Because the devil of the adversary is at work. And so he is going to come in if he could have, if he could have went to Eve, Adam and Eve in a subtle way with that creeping compromise and added that word not to them who were in the light. He is admonishing all of us that we are to hold steadfast to the light. We are to do as he has bid us to do while we have the night, because you never know what may happen, what the devil may come up with. And we should be able to stand with the light and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Absolutely. All right. So, elders, we're going to get into Tuesday's lesson. Tuesday's lesson is entitled Safeguarded by the Word. Safeguarded by the Word. Now, we know, elders, that the word of God is powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, it says, of itself. And we know that the word of God has raised people from the dead, has healed those who are sick, has separated or split the seas wide open, have brought fire down from heaven. You name it, the word of God has done so. And we have today, well, maybe not so much in bound texts, more so electronically than anything else. We have the Bible today that has been given to us by God, preserved through time. And so the word that we have today is the most important word that there ever can be. And so as we get into the study for safeguarded by the word, it is saying now that there is a safeguard that the word provides for all of us. So let's look at the lesson for today. Compare John 17, 15 to 17 and Acts 20, 32. Elder Gordon, read for us John 17, verse 15 to 17. And Elder David, I want you to read for us Acts chapter 20, verse 32. In John 17, 15 to 17, reading from the New International Version. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. And Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 says, Now I commit you to God, to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Okay, excellent. So we're comparing both passages of scripture, Acts 20, 32 and John 17, 15 to 17. What insights, I'm going to start with you, Elder David, what insights do Jesus and the Apostle Paul give us regarding protection from the deceptions of Satan? Elder David, let me start with you. What insights do Jesus and the Apostle Paul give us regarding protection from the deceptions of Satan? What insights do they give to us? If I may read Acts 22, 30, it says, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Now, the word is critically important. If we are going to navigate this life successfully and make it to heaven, to eternity eventually. Now, he says the word sanctifies. To sanctify something is to make it holy. When we accept the Lord Jesus as our Lord and personal Savior, we ought to go on to grow. You see, when God created us, he created us in his image. That image was marred by sin. So Christ came and gave his life 
in an effort to rebuild that image of God that was damaged in us. So when we accept the Lord Jesus as our Lord and personal Savior, we go on a journey to become sanctified, to become holy, to rebuild that image in us. And the word is what does that. So as Christians, we ought to feast on the word because that is what causes us to grow to the point where we receive our heavenly inheritance. Absolutely. We need to feast on the word. Elder Gordon, can we feast on the word and become fat cats and become obese? That's why we have to walk while we have the light. And you know, walking is one of the most important exercises there is if we have to take it walk literally and that is why it is so important as children of god recognizing and so we are so happy that we're dealing with the great controversy the battle for the mind the great controversy and if you notice why christ no, the, the scripture that i received let me read it is john 17 15 to 17. my prayer jesus is praying here my prayer it's not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And so this is where the sanctification comes. We are to feast, as Elder David said, on the word of God. You see, when we get into the word of God, we get an understanding. The Holy Spirit will teach us the battle, what is really happening between good and evil. Notice, we must be sanctified by truth. We have to be pure by the word of God. In other words, there's no form of compromise. There's no room for compromise. On the other hand, Satan, all he wants is a compromise. I can bring in the commandments here. Satan don't have a problem if you you keep denying. But once you have a problem with one of the commandments, he allow that creeping compromise to defile us, to cause, cause us to walk in falsehood. So to answer your question, we are not to be obese. We cannot be obese with the word of God. The word of God is an action word. The word of God is light and light shines in darkness. And so we who represent the light, we are to go where there are darkness. You are asking uh, even about the topic for today, that the light shine in darkness. My answer to that is the world is in darkness. Satan seemed to have dominance on this world. And even if you go back to Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they ran from God. We can say that they were in darkness, but the light of the world, Jesus Christ, God himself, where that light went seeking after man who had fallen into sin so that he can rescue them with the plan of salvation. So yes, there's darkness prevailing the land, but it is the people of God, his we the children of God who are to go to them with the light, the truth of God, so that they can understand the battle that is raging. So they can understand that Satan is the one who perpetrates this, this war. Satan is the one who seeks to, to dethrone God. Satan is the one who wants us on his side. And then when they understand that the word of God is saturated with God's love to mankind, well, who would not want to come out of darkness into a light where they can see the love of Jesus? Excellent. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon. Elder David, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture, and the very first word there is, is a superlative. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. My question for you, Elder David, is that why should we take all scripture? Why should we accept all scripture? Why can't we accept just the ones that are favorable to us? I mean, even in the Bible, you find passages of scripture that are troublesome, that are hard to understand. You find some things, for example, in the book of Job, where Job's friends were speaking to him, giving some long monologues, and the things they were saying were like, like I guess you could say rubbish. They were totally misled and misleading Job. And there are other parts of scripture where you find things that seem so hard to understand. So can we actually, or should we actually um, take all scripture and, and accept it? How do we harmonize that? Well, well, the Bible says all scripture. It says all scripture is given by inspiration. All scripture 
is inspired by God. And because it is inspired by God, we ought to accept it as God's word. There are times when we may not understand all of it. There are times when we may see some apparent contradictions in the word, but they're still God's word. We may not understand it. That doesn't mean that it is not God's word. It is not inspired. We ought to, when we study Bible, allow the Bible to be its own in interpreter. We may not understand, but if we continue to search, we are going to find in the very Bible that the answer to the apparent contradictions. But all scripture, the Bible says, is given by inspiration. We ought to accept it because it is God's inspired word. We may not, not always understand all of it, but it's all God's word. Excellent. Anything to add there, Sister God? I have a specific question for you. Anything to add to that one I'd ask Elder David? I think Elder David answered it profoundly. Excellent. No problem. So let's move on to the next question. The question I have for you, Elder God, is that what are some of the things that the Bible reveals to us? For one thing, I know that it reveals God's love, but are there other things that it reveals to us and in what way does it reveal them to us? Because if you're going to accept all scripture, and we should, then all scripture should be revealing certain things to us, the followers of Christ. So what are some of those things that the Bible is revealing to us? But to come to wrap that love, let us say that it reveals who God is. It gave us a basic understanding of who he is. We understand why the son of God had to come in the form of man. We understand the great controversy, the battle for the mind. And I think that is so important because we know the war started in heaven. And so the, the revelation says, woe be unto the inhabitants of the earth, for Satan has come down with great wrath. So woe unto us. So yes, the Bible is there as an instruction manual. He asks us to walk in the light. But as we walk, you know, as a driver, there are signs on the road so that we look at the street signs to know the direction to go in order for us to reach our destination. We now have Google Map. We can drive us key in certain codes and it will direct us as to where to go on earth. The same thing with God's manual. And God has been there before Google, before internet. It is such a powerful thing that, yes, the Bible is wrapped up with love. We can call it love. It encompasses love. But as we go into the intricacies of the Bible, God is directing us how to walk daily. We just did the book of Psalm where we understand that even if the wicked are prospering and as Christians, we may look and see why is God, why is that Happening. We have an understanding that God is always on our side. So I think it's a manual for us, just as we need a manual for our fridge and our car and everything. God is directing us as to how to walk so that one day we can make it heaven at last. So the, man, the, the it's God's manual for his people so we can make it to heaven at last and to defeat the devil, not by might nor by power, but by the spirit of the living God. Excellent. Elder David, so all scripture is inspired by God. Can we or should we use anything else? Or let me rephrase the question. What else do we need, if at all anything else? to understand God's word or to, to understand the sacred truths about God. You said, what else do we need? The only other thing we need to understand God's word, it is his Holy Spirit to help us to interpret what he in the first place inspired. But there are other supporting uh, documents that we can use. Granted, we do not need them, but there are other documents we can use history books and some history books can corroborate some of what the, what the bible teaches but all we are we really need to understand the bible is the word and the spirit excellent so we need the spirit to guide us to teach us breathe upon us to show us the proper and the correct interpretation and application of the word of god some people elder david speak about using extra biblical books like the apocrypha and all these other books what do you say about using those and the problem with those is that you can't trust them. Some of them contain errors. There's some of them. One of the things I found out about them is that there isn't anything in them that can authenticate them as the inspired word of God. For example, they do not have predictive prophecy. You wouldn't find the miracles in them like Jesus would have performed. They have errors. Okay. I remember there's one story in, I think, in the book of Thomas, which is not Thomas the disciple. 
which has a story that says Jesus, when he was a child, raised the bird from death to life. They, they contradict the Bible. They do not, some of them teach salvation by works. I remember reading that uh, some of them teach that we can pray to the dead. God hears the prayer of the dead. So we can't trust them. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Elder Gordon, I'm going to read this passage, then I'm going to ask you to comment upon it. In our study guide for today, it says, Hence, we must fight against any and all attempts to undermine its authority or inscription, even from those who, while professing great love of the Bible, bring doubts about it, even subtly. We're talking about fighting against keeping up the standard of the word of God. And it is saying that some bring doubts about it, even subtly, even those among us. Do we see that happening, Elder Garden, today? Or do you see that happening within the community of faith, within Christendom even, where people are bringing in doubts about the word of God and the authenticity of it and so on and so forth? Of course, it is still happening. It started with the devil in the, uh, the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And amazingly, that is why we have so many denominations. That's why some people will say they're so frustrated with Christians because everybody teaching so many different things. Uh, is there's some churches that are split because one believe in speaking in tongues and one believe in praying to the dead. And, and so all these things that are happening. And this is the plan of the devil. The devil recognized, according to Sister White, that he can, could not fight us from the outside. So he has come into the church and there is where the battle is creeping compromise and so he just wants to know that he taint the word of god mix it with error and so this is why we have to be so careful because we need the undiluted word of god when we can see we have all these different religions and all of them are using the bible and yet still they're so vast in their beliefs and some would stand the outside and wonder we, what's the truth and you don't understand it. We see it happening in, in the Bible. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they just have a little variation, a little difference. So we have to stand on the word of God. The word of God is truth. And some may say, how do we know? That is why we get into the word of God. That is why the Holy Spirit, when Jesus was born, he said it is better that he go. Because when he go, he will leave, give us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, one of the characteristic traits of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth. If we want truth, we pray to God, ask the Holy Spirit to help us. And we get into the word of God. His Holy Spirit will direct us so that we can find truth of the living God. Okay, thank you so much, Elder God. And Elder David, coming back to you. We live in a postmodern world. That's what they term it. We live in a world where there is now a call modern thinking. And we have, sadly, theologians and Christians of note who are making certain statements or having this modern way of thinking that the Bible is not exactly how we should see it all along. So this portion of our study says that some theologians, many theologians and Christians, focus on the human side of Scripture that the Bible becomes the word of man instead, the word of God. And then Elder David, says, the Bible, they argue, is the writings of kings, shepherds, fishermen, priests, poets, and others who shared their understandings and con conceptions of God, of nature, and of reality, the best that they, in their time and place, understood them. Is that really, Elder David, what the Bible is? A bunch of people writing from different walks of life, how they understood things then, and that's all that, that there is? No, the thing is, God used human beings to write the Bible. But they were under the influence, under the direction of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, God breathed, all right? God directed them. While they would have, let's say their personality and so on may have come out in their writing, their style. It is God's word. They were under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you look at the Bible and the harmony that you see in the Bible, in the Gospels, when you look at the prophecies in the Old Testament and how they were fulfilled in the New Testament, if it was left up to human beings alone, there could not have been such, a, such harmony in the Word of God. Yes, God used men, but they were, were under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They did not write their own words. And Elder, that is Go why... Ahead. 
That is why it is the thought that is inspired and not the word. If you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they describe the resurrection morning, some say while it is still, while it was dark. Some say while it was dawning. So they use different description to describe very early in the morning. But at the same time, what is important in the scripture is the fact that early in the morning, the tomb was rolled away, Christ was risen. That's the whole idea. That's the central nature of it. It wasn't the word when it was dawning or mid-morning or six o'clock in the morning or whatever time word we want to use to describe the morning. But the thought, the main point of the scripture is to indicate that G the stone was rolled away and Jesus was risen. Absolutely, absolutely. That's so true. We cannot depend upon man to, on their own, to write anything that is divine. It has to be, as the Bible says, to the Holy Spirit breathing upon them. And the Bible has many writers, but only one author, because God is the author of, of all holy writ. So I'm going to read several passages as we wind down for today. And then I'm going to ask a question to both of you, then we're going to have our, our takeaways. So I'm reading Psalm 119, verse 105. And it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We're talking about safeguarded by the word today. Verse 116 of Psalm 119 says, uphold me according to your word that I may live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Moving on to verse 130, it says, the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Hallelujah. And verse 133 of Psalm 119 says, Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. And finally, Psalm 119, 160 says, The eternity of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Now, elders, look at the plethora of texts that we just looked at from just that one psalm. What insights does the psalmist give us regarding the significance of God's word in the plan of salvation? The, the significance, elders, of God's word in the plan of salvation. I'm going to start with you, Elder God. Well, that's, that's the word, and that's where love comes. The plan of salvation is for us to understand that we are living in the great controversy, for us to understand that Christ came to pay the price that we we should pay because of our sin. He who knew no sin paid the price for sinners. He died, resurrected, and remember too, all these things that happened to Jesus was prophesied. And we're talking about how the world of God is true. It was prophesied. Everything happened right on time. He came. He went back to heaven. In heaven, he's interceding for us. And this is why the scripture that you read there, Psalm 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So we're talking about the light again. And we're talking about us walking, living daily through the word of God. So that through the aid of the Holy Spirit and our faithfulness and trust and faith in him who is faithful. Once we keep our eyes upon Jesus, we will make it to heaven at last. Amen. Elder David. Okay, I would like to add one more text to the list that you read. Psalm 119 and verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Now, what significance do these have in our lives regarding salvation? Everything. Now, we are looking at the fact that the devil wants us to compromise. The only safeguard we have against compromise, and the devil does it by mixing truth with error is to have the word of God etched in our minds. And as we live our lives, every decision we make, every choice we make, should be guided by that word that we have hidden in our heart. When we are called upon to make a decision, how does it line up? When we are called upon to choose something, how does it line up with God's word? And that is how I like to look at it. Every decision, every choice we make in life must be guided by the word. And for us to do that, we must know what the word says. And that is how eventually we are going to make it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It guides me. Thy word have I hid in my heart.
that I may not sin against thee. It has everything to do with our, our salvation. I trust that we'll hide God's word in our heart so that we can be guided. It can be like to us as we walk through this life. All right. Thank you so much, Elder David. You know, I look at it. Some I've heard somebody said that the, the, the word of God is like guardrails at the side of the road. So as you're driving your vehicle, the guardrails will prevent you from bursting over, running off the road and going over a cliff or a precipice. And so the guardrails keep you within that, the, the, road, the, the road that you're driving on. But I look at it a little differently. I look at it that the word that I've hid in my heart that I may not sin against you, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I see it as the word being within the person's mind and actually behind the steering wheel. And so therefore you're able to maneuver that vehicle wherever you want to go in the way in which it ought to go because the word is within you. The guardrails, yes, they might help as well. But it's better if you don't get into the guardrails in the first place and just stay on the road. And so elders, we've come to the conclusion of our study. Your takeaways for today, Elder Gordon, we have looked at safeguarded by the word and your takeaway for today's study, Elder Gordon. My takeaway is taken from Matthew chapter 8. We talk about the centurion. And he recognizing that he was a Roman. He wasn't a Jew. But when he heard about Jesus, and this is why the word of God came and dwelt among men, so that we could have a footprint of what Jesus did to help us, as you say, to grant us onto that, that guardrail. But when that centurion had his servant at home sick unto death, Jesus said to the centurion, I will come to thy house. Because he understood who Jesus was, he was truth. He was the word. He was life. He said, no, Lord, my home is not worthy for you. But he said, just say the word and my servant will be healed. This man knew that the word had power. This man knew that the word was truth. This man knew that the word was life. And he said, just said the word and my servant will be healed. He didn't want Jesus to come and touch him and hold him and come into his roof. He, Jesus could have stayed where he was and just spoke the word. Today, I say to all of us, the word is truth, the word of God. This Holy Spirit is here with us. Let us just dwell on the word, feast on the word, allow the word to be to embolden us to such an extent that our faith will be so overwhelmed that there will be no room for compromise in our lives. Thank you so much, Elder David, your final word for today. Okay, our, the topic of our study for today says safeguarded by the word. My takeaway is simply this. If we are going to be safeguarded by the word, we are told in Psalm 105 and Psalm 119, 105 and Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. If the word is going to serve as a guard real to us, as a safeguard for us, we have to hide it in our hearts. So my admonition is, let us hide the word in our hearts by reading and studying it so that it can indeed be a safeguard for us as we navigate life. I want to say thanks to Elder David and Elder Gordon once again for their commitment and for their insights in the lesson study for today. I want to say thanks to you, our viewers, who continue to support and to comment and to allow this channel and this ministry to grow. Safeguarded by the word, the word of God cements us. The word of God directs us. The word of God not just informs us, but it it shows us how we ought to live. Let us be living our lives by the word of God and by nothing else. We thank you once again. Remember, we come your way tomorrow with another episode of Whispering Hope as we continue the Bible study of the great controversy for this quarter. Until then, may God bless you. Have a wonderful day.